Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. I think it's a much more reasonable, independent musician business mindset. It was an eye-opening experience. It really influenced my music. It influenced my appreciation for humanity and how music is translated and communicated and performed. It really changed my entire perspective on how independent musicians can make a living. The kids are screaming everywhere. You know, more people should start doing that in their communities. It's just a great way to share. And, and I find that that sort of build, that kind of setup and community building is a really amazing experience. And people are getting a lot out of it. We live in the kind of world nowadays that people are starting to really dive into themselves and try to work for themselves and find what, what's passion in each of our souls and try and work on it. And that's inspiring for everybody else to see that. So the more we can do that and then yet come together and help each other, like hopefully it'll just keep growing, you know? And everyone forgets the part. Doesn't matter, we all love. I don't know, for me, that's what life is. That's the magic of life, having these moments that we can really focus in on and celebrate art and sharing and community and what makes us really human. This life, this life, this life. Hello, this is Fei Wu, and I am your host for the Phase World podcast. Today, I have Jesse Mocked joining me as a very special guest. Jesse is a singer and songwriter. His melodies are an abundance of stories overflowing with passion, vulnerability, empathy, and honesty. In 2014, he released his sophomore album called Suke's Heart after a scary personal health issue and an unexpected breakup. In July 2016, just earlier this year, Jesse successfully signed with What A Guy Record and has been producing his junior album to be released in spring 2017. If you think this description so far sounds like some other musicians you've heard of, well, Jesse caught my attention with his grassroots growth in the music world. He is smart, entrepreneurial, and incredibly authentic. He started his journey connecting with his 1,000 true fans, a wildly popular article by Kevin Kelly and promoted by some of my favorite gurus such as Seth Godin, Tim Ferriss, and James Altucher. It really works. Jesse found so many people through home concerts. And basically, you can invite Jesse to play in your living room or at an event you host. The sign-up information is on his website, jessemockedmusic.com. I've also included this information on phaseworld.com under the blog post for Jesse's episode. This conversation dives deep into Jesse's music, as well as living a life as a musician. He talks about members of his family who have influenced him to become a musician and other singers, songwriters, who contributed to his growth and success today. Brian Koppelman said that creating is failure all the time. I asked Jesse just how he keeps showing up for his work. How does he manage external and internal validations? Really, how do creative people in general find the strength and courage to keep creating? Positivity is an important source of creative energy Jesse never stops focusing on. To generate and sustain that energy, Jesse finds joy in enabling others to discover something of their own through his music, and more importantly, his stories. He believes everyone has a story. It's only a matter of finding or establishing the right environment, whether it's through home concerts or a podcast platform or a simple gathering of people sharing what make them tick. An hour went by quickly, and I hope you find your gem in and outside of this conversation. If you like this episode, please visit phaseworld.com for more stories like this. You can also subscribe to this podcast now, where while you're listening through a simple click on your mobile phone, it literally takes seconds. All new full and mini episodes will be delivered to you automatically, and thank you so much for your support. 
Without further ado, please welcome Jesse Ma to the Face World Podcast. Thanks for uh, organizing this with me. It's very nice. Absolutely. I want to thank you because the holiday season probably is crazy for everybody. So thanks so much for making the time. I'm super glad. I feel like uh, for me, the past week or so uh, went from Faye's world to Jesse's world pretty quickly because uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to learn so much more about you. And one of the things I notice is you, I think you have a new contract or I guess a, I believe that you have a junior record uh, to be released very soon, what has already been out this fall. Yeah, um, I have a new record that's going to come out this spring. There's been some back and forth and different dates. Um, and some of my fans know that I've been working on this record for a long time. And I'm going back into the studio, actually, to record some new songs and add to this record. So we're planning on putting, um, you're right, my junior record, which is just in terms of my records, I put out one about four years ago, another one about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Now this will be my third, but this will be my debut um, with this new record label. Which is What A Guy Record? (laughs) Yep, What A Guy Record. That's it. That's right. Wow. Is there any, I know it's just like a film that you don't want to talk too much about it, but what are some of the theme changes and what are some new ideas that you're instilling into the new album? Um, You know, uh, some of the older stuff, the last record, Suitcase Heart, that I did, um, there was two sort of general themes that were going on there. One of which was I had gotten out of a relationship that I'd been in for a long time that had ended. So I was going through the healing process of that using my art as a way to heal and express myself, but also just practically, I did a lot of co-writes on that, which means I just did a lot of writing with other artists to write the songs. I probably wrote about 25 songs when I was preparing for that record. And We ended up using about four that I co-wrote, and then there was another five that were just mine. And with this new record, these are all songs that I wrote on my own. And for me, that's just kind of exciting because I felt like the songs that people really were attracted to on the Suitcase Heart record, my sophomore record, were the songs that I had written on my own. And I think I had some moments of, you know, collaboration, not necessarily insecurity, but I, I felt like, well, maybe I should do some co-writes and just get some other perspective. And with this record, I really tried to follow my heart and trust my instincts and trust my sound. And and uh, I came out with something that I'm, I'm really proud of. That said, we're going back into the studio to record a few more because with this new label that we wanted to uh, have a few different songs that I've currently been working on that I didn't record. They heard this new record. They loved it. And they were like, look, they signed me promising to put out the new record. And after we signed, they listened to it and they loved it. But they said, you know, let's do you mind working on like four of your newer songs that we've heard? Because we really like those. And instead of waiting for a senior record, as you put it, as a fourth <laughs> record, um, let's just throw these on this new record. So I'm fine with that. And I'm excited to do that. So we're going to just put together something that we're really proud of for 2017. Well, I'm super excited for you. And I'm going to hold off on my million questions for Suitcase Heart. And since we're in a role right now to talk about the yeah. new record, I'm somehow on a roll this week after announcing that this conversation I had, several other musical musician friends, um, I've been recording almost exclusively podcast episodes with musicians this week. And I have been very touched by this uh, sort of the process of being a musician and um, how you know, difficult of uh, sometimes of a career it can be. So with this new record, I guess one of my first questions, I noticed you've been touring uh, quite a bit and I haven't really seen you tour on the East Coast. So what is the release process for the new record? And is there a chance for like for us to meet in person and, you know? For sure. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the music business is a complicated business. And one way that I found to release Suitcase Heart, my last record, in a grassroots sort of original way that was conducive to the style of music that I perform, which comes from a practical business sense in that I play with a band, the the studio recordings have a full band on them, but I can't always afford to bring a band out with me. It's expensive, obviously, to pay for five people in a, in a van and going from here to there and gas and hotels, et cetera. So sometimes I have to tour just on my own, which is fine. So one way that I 
I thought, well, how am I going to do this? And as opposed to just playing in bars and, and small music venues and, and hustling and building a fan base that way, I thought, well, why don't I just reach directly out to my fans and see if they would allow me to perform in their homes? So I started doing that with the Suitcase Heart record, and I toured two years on that record, touring around the United States and then doing some small tours in Europe and performing directly for my fans in their living rooms. And it was an eye-opening experience. It really influenced my music. It influenced my appreciation for humanity and my and how music is translated and communicated and performed. It really changed my entire perspective on how independent musicians can make a living. Um, the old rules of the music business were get a single, put it on the radio, and uh, if it's on the radio, chances are if it gets played, you know, for three to six weeks, you can sell between a hundred thousand and five hundred thousand records at least, and hopefully you'll make it into the millions and you'll be fine. That business model works a little bit, but not really so much anymore. I think it was something like Beyonce's or Rih- Rihanna's debut sold seventeen thousand records, which is nothing. And that was like number one, 17,000. So that's a far cry from uh, hundreds of thousands and millions. That said, I'm sure it's gone on to sell hundreds of thousands. But as opposed to trying to find, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to spend $10 on me, you know, buying a record, I'm hoping to find really a close knit community that really gets my music and gets where I'm coming from and my lifestyle. You know, as opposed to looking for hundreds of thousands of people, my goal has been much smaller. It's look for tens of thousands, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and try and see if we can communicate on a deeper level and then offer so much more content to a specific audience. And if I can get a small, tight knit group of people who are maybe willing to spend $100 on me a year, as opposed to hundreds of thousands willing to spend seven to $10 on me a year. I think it's a much more reasonable independent musician business mindset. And it's something that a lot of other indie musicians are doing as well. And it just seems more reasonable, you know, as a, as a business. So that's kind of where I came from. My music asks for intimate attention and it asks for people to really listen to the lyrics and, and try and figure out the metaphors. And that's a lot to ask out of listeners, especially in today's climate. We want things that are easily understood a lot and we have short attention spans and, I know that I'm asking a lot out of my my fans, but the ones who really do adhere, uh, not adhere, the ones who really get me and, and like listening to me, I think they've got a really dense sense of themselves and dense sense of art, and they want to engage with that. And so I think I want to give them as much content as I can. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. I have to say that I think um, what Really, a part of what you're doing, uh, the touring and the Treasure Hunt tour really resonated with me on a very deep level because I, you know, I did not work in radio. Well, I did when I was a teenager, but professionally, you know, this is not what I do. And one of the Uh reasons, you know, I found so fascinating is because at some point I loved podcasting, but then I was really kind of getting tired and sick of these 25 men like trading lip service and it's always the same story. Right. And, you know, I found out about you through Treasure Hunt Tour and just the story behind it, which is uh, sort of the trading and sort of the bartering process where people are coming together and you are performing in front of a small crowd. And you talked about this in an interview, I believe it was a music blog, that, you know, people are coming up to you and sharing stories that possibly they've never talked about before. And you're almost sharing, exchanging treasures uh, with each other. So mm-hmm. that's that's really phenomenal. Well, that was that. Yeah, that was the idea because Suitcase Heart, that sort of idea came from that record that we put out. It comes from this idea that we all have a story in our heart and we travel around the world with it. And as a musician, very much so. And, you know, we either have the courage to let those stories out. and We can tell a lot of people or maybe we don't have that courage. There's it's not better or worse, but we all do have a story. So I wanted to bring that idea to the tour and say, OK, I'm going to come into your homes and perform. And thank you for allowing me in there. But now if I'm going to share my stories and come to you, then that's fine. But I'm going to ask you to maybe uh, engage with me too. And instead of buying my record, maybe you'll donate, maybe you won't, but without the pressure, I'll give you my record. That's my, I'll trade you. Um, You can either give me $10 if that's what it is, but I will also trade you my record for something that's a prize story of yours. Because if I'm going to give you my story, then I want to hear yours. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I thought, wow, let's see what happens. And what ended <laughs> up happening was incredible. People were giving me little treasures from their lives and taking me aside and say, okay, so I'd give them my record with my stories. And then they'd give me a bracelet or a locket or um, a flower that they had that they had kept in a book or a little toy soldier or a, a bunch of things. I like just so many different little treasures. And then they would tell me the story along with that treasure. And I felt like, wow, this is really a rich way to barter and a really cool way to bring people in and understand the lifestyle that I'm trying to communicate and to say that we all share. And then it gave a really cool avenue to the music. And that tour was a lot of fun. So I'm excited to see what I come up with for this next <laughs> tour, what we'll do with this next record. That is not, I have not created the idea yet. I think I got to get the record finished and start putting dates together and reach out to people and see what their homes, what they're willing to do. But next summer, we'll really see what we can do. But hopefully it'll be in that same world of the Treasure Hunt Tour. I will. I would love to be able to contribute in some way. And I know this is still work in progress, but I was wondering, what does it take to kind of have you travel to a place? I know the East Coast is quite far away, but what are some of the ideas and how should someone or, or an organization go about scheduling that trip for you? Yeah, I have a, a form on my website that people can go to and fill out at any time, even when I don't have a tour organized and they don't see any dates for that necessarily, that flyer's always there. And I will come and do one-offs if I can afford it, you know? Um, depending on the times, that, you know, it changes in terms of what I can afford. So if I do a, a one-off home concert in Boston, obviously that'll be a little more expensive than if I'm already on tour and I'm going up the East Coast and, you know, you say, I want to do a home concert tour. Well, then I'm already on the way so I can make it work. But generally that's what I do. I announce a tour and I reach out to everybody across the country and I'm like, hey, are you interested in doing a home concert? Generally, we try to make them all free. And we say like to hosts, we say to the host, this is a free concert. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to perform in the home. You know, are you willing to put out a donation bucket? And are you willing to let me sell my CDs and t-shirts and, you know, stickers and whatnot? And um, let's try and put as many as we can together for this, because it's more about sharing this community and, and creating the music. And I trust that when I come into your home, I'm going to do my job of performing. And I think that people will feel like, oh, I want to help this guy out. And somehow people donate and, and it works out. And so far, every tour um, has worked out that way in the States. So that's how I, I will probably go forward doing the summer. I'll, I'll put a bunch of dates up and hopefully people will reach out and be like, hey, I want you in New York. I want you in Boston. I want you in Philly. I want you in St. Louis. I want you in Florida. You know, And I generally, I route it and put it together and then I get in my car and I go. I, I love that. I Probably because I'm not, I haven't really worked in the music world. This model is very new to me. And perhaps it's on the East Coast. I guess we're always falling behind a little bit. But I can imagine you pack up your suitcase and maybe perform in front of a, you know, like there's Harvard Square. I don't know how many times you've traveled to Boston, but it's such yeah. a incredible scene over there, you know, professionals, non-professionals. And during the summer, it's absolutely gorgeous and tolerable in New England. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, it's getting really well, cold. But No, it's great. I came to Boston and did two home concerts there last summer, and they were great. So I anticipate that I'll, I'll be back there doing it again. You know, I, I just love the idea of people bringing me into their homes and going to their living rooms. And it's great. And you just, you have a party and you say, hey, can I get, you know, 20 friends to come over? And it doesn't matter if it's a house or an apartment or a condo or a yurt, I'm, I'll show up. Um, and I just ask that people bring, you know, 20 friends of theirs and at least, and some of these parties turn out to be, you know, 200 people and some of them turn out to be 25 people. Uh -huh. And either way, it's always a great experience. I haven't had one bad home concert. I've played about 80 of them now. And they're a really great way to bring in music. And the East Coast is by no means in the back or the rear view. They, uh, uh, some of these home concerts really got started in New York. And there are different little companies that are throwing home concerts all the time. It's something that's getting really popular with, with independent musicians. And it's really cool. You know, I've actually... I host a home concert series because I felt like I had to put up or shut up, you know, if I was going <laughs> to do these and I got to throw some home concerts too for other people. And I started this new uh, home concert series here in Los Angeles called Sunsets at Great Scott. Um, I named it that. And it's uh, at my friend's house. His name is John. He's an actor and a ceramicist and a, and a landscape artist. 
And we have been throwing these tremendous home concerts at the house. And we'll have musicians, we'll have comedians, we'll have lecturers, we'll have academics, we'll have all sorts of, it's kind of like what it sounds like your podcast. We'll have all sorts of different kinds of people performing or speaking in different ways. Right. And Airstream, who are these vintage trailers that you might have seen on the back of cars, they got wind of these. I, I reached out to them to see if they would sponsor a home concert tour of mine. And they said, oh, we just put another artist out doing exactly that. But we'd love to sponsor your home concerts that you're doing. Uh, we'd love to help you create them because we think it's a great idea. So we'll give you a little bit of money. You shoot them and uh, we'll post them on our site. So I've already thrown about 10 of these. And now this will be the first one that we've really filmed appropriately. But I bring it up just because it's something that I have a passion for. And I think that, you know, more people should start doing that in their communities. It's just a great way to share and and look for people in your in your life, in your world that that have something to share, whether it's songs or, you know, maybe it's I'm a scientist and I'm a researcher and I, I work on this uh, infectious diseases, you know, project that I'd really love to share and teach people about. And I find that 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 sort of bill, that kind of setup and community building is a really amazing experience and people are getting a lot out of it. And I'm just hoping that this will be a little bit of a fad that that's created for the next few years so that not only musicians are doing this, but comedians and all sorts of other talented people are sharing and that people don't feel tied to having to go to music venues all the time, uh, that people don't feel like they have to go to comedy venues, like that sometimes we can just create art out of our homes. This life, this life, this life, this life, this life, this life, this life who we hold on to is everything we've lived and lost and gone through. And won't you come on home? We're waiting for you. Absolutely. I mean, what you're talking about, I feel like. This is something that we, especially living in this country, desperately need right now is uh, to understand one another, you know. Yeah, understanding. Exactly. I mean, not to go into the endless conversation of election, but I feel like there is that, you know, that kind of tremendous pressure and and just friction between people who don't look alike. Or it's a very, it's very sad for me to witness all of that. But before I forget, I mean, I recently had some sort of a very mild success with Facebook Live. I had, yeah. you know, no idea. And is it possible? I mean, you're going to have a final edited version of this endeavor. But what if you just turn on your phone and we can watch you perform at home or at totally. this venue? Don't worry. That is already that is already in process. We'll put it up. We'll probably do a Facebook Live because that seems to be the one that everyone's doing. I've done a lot of Periscopes, which uses the same technology. There's an app called Periscope. So we'll probably do a Facebook Live or Periscope, but don't you worry. I'll tweet it out on my, my uh, socials and we'll have it up for sure. We'll have just like a master shot in the back and, and people can sort of have a bird's eye view of that for sure. Yeah, that's it's wonderful, and uh, the I think you have you will have a ton of audience uh, watching you perform that way. I had no idea that. I mean, by the way, I'm like a uber nerd when it comes to technology, and uh, that's something I've been doing professionally for ten years and web design development. But you know, Facebook unfortunately turned the it turned in itself into this pay to play model, and uh, even with thousands of fans on your page, essentially it's a single digit of them, a percentage yeah. of them. But with Facebook Live, um, their Facebook is actually prioritizing those videos. So you instantly gain so many more views and engagement. Unfair, yeah, yeah. but take advantage yep. of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I will. I will I'll get it on. It. And and this is a process. I mean, anybody who's in the Los Angeles area is welcome to come to this. We have a 100-person a cap. So usually, right now, we average attendance about 50 to 70 people. So there's room. So come on out. This next one, for sure, will be a little bit busier. It's going to be a great night. We have the Silver Lake Chorus performing, which is a hipster choir out of Silver Lake. They're really, really talented. They are singing all original content created for them by top indie radio artists like Tegan and Sarah and Bon Iver. 
So they're going to be performing. They're great. And then there's another group called Story Pirates, which is a sketch comedy group. And they are hilarious. They take they take stories that uh, kindergarten, first grade and second grade kids have written. They take those stories and then they act them out. And wow. they choose the best ones and they act them out. And it's just so funny to watch these improvisers and great, great talented comedians act out children's stories. I mean, we're talking about dragons that are rolling in, you know, milkshakes and saving princes and princesses. Meanwhile, walking down the street and jumping in Ferraris and then washing themselves with mud. You know, it's like the the stories just go left and right. You never know where they're going to go because they're kids' minds. So it's very funny to see it happen. I encourage people to tune in and and check out the videos. And if they're in LA to come check it out, because it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great time. Sounds awesome. I'm a huge fan of, I think there's a website called Overheard at Home of parents kind of sharing stories from their kids. And I I just, I just laugh to death each time. I can imagine. That's funny. (laughs) funny. Yeah. So this home concert thing is, I mean, this home home concert world and business at the end of the day has, is really growing and, and spreading out and especially for me, it's just a world that I, I really love. And I'm looking forward to getting back out and playing concerts when this record finally comes out. I know it's been a long time for some of my really devoted fans, and I'm so appreciative of their patience. And for people who are new to me, it's going to be really exciting to get out this music for them. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if you know the, the concept or the theory of a thousand true fans. And, yeah. Yeah. And then Seth Godin, who's one of my favorite, probably the favorite uh, online guru who talks about building a tribe. And that's precisely what you're describing. And honestly, I only wish that so many other people would know this and just believe in that. And, you know, personally, I mean, my podcast is nothing compared to the top 50 and, and all of that, but I've been able to reach out to, I know you listen to uh, NPR. I know that kind of inspired your uh, first album as well. And I got to talk to Krista Tibbet and- Oh, wow. I know. I was giggling out of control. I was so nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but this is fantastic. I, I just like, I'm looking at all these questions. I'm being able to connect with you and just hearing you talk about these things is so refreshing to me. Um, cool. I love it because I can hear in your voice just uh, how passionate you are about um, what you do. And um, speaking of which, I couldn't go because I forgot the internet wasn't all that popular back in, you know, just say even... 14, 15 years ago. So I try to go all the way back to, or do you remember a time when, I know you play music, I watched, I'm a huge fan, by the way, I'm jumping around, I'm a huge fan of the song, This Light, and turns out it's everybody else feels the same way on top of the <laughs> other songs, and especially during this holiday season, you know, yeah. uh, just watching you as a little kid, you know, and the, the video shot of you as a child hugging your mom and then, you know, 20 years later. And, and I noticed that you started playing instruments, including the piano and the guitar very early on. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your, maybe your origin stories and perhaps like when you knew at what age you were saying, this is it, I'm going to be a musician. Well, you know? my mom thought it was really important to play an instrument. She thinks it's really important. So I played piano from as far back as I can remember. And I sang from as far back as I can remember. Piano, I didn't necessarily enjoy as a kid. I found it to be very frustrating. And But singing, I always did like. I think there's something chemical and physical that just feels good about singing. And I, I, I did always enjoy that. And so I played piano. And as soon as I got old enough and was fighting enough with my mom about not wanting to play piano, she said, fine, but you got to play another instrument. So I learned how to play the violin. And I did that for three years. And then I got sick of that. And I said, let me play drums. And I played drums for four years. And I was in high school. And I made friends with two very charismatic, handsome, really awesome guys. And we were joking around. And one day I was like, you know, we should start a band. I know you guys play music. And they were like, yeah, let's start a band. So I invited them over that afternoon. They came over to my house. I sat down at my drums. I was like, all right, let's do it. What do you guys play? And they said, we've all played drums. <laughs> so we were three guys that played drums. So we were like, oh, what are we going to do? I was like, I kind of play piano, but I don't want to play piano. And so we drew straws for what instruments we needed. And I drew guitar. My friend drew piano. And my other friend got to stay on the drums. So I had to start learning how to guitar. So I spent two weeks just learning guitar and fell in love with it quickly because I could sing right away. 
um, with guitar. And that's sort of, that's sort of what jumped me into it. And as soon as I had that band in high school, I just, it was the most fun thing I was doing. I was doing a lot of stuff, but that was it. And, um, we eventually added another guitar player and he took me to one of my first concerts in LA for a local band. The band was called Kara's Flowers. K-A-R-A, Kairos Flowers. And I saw them. I, I was like, oh my God, I want to do this. This band is awesome. And two years later, Kairos Flowers turned into Maroon and Maroon got signed to a record deal and Maroon turned into Maroon 5. And, you Whoa. know, just watching, yeah, just watching those guys start from an eighth grade, ninth grade band and turn into one of the biggest bands this country has ever seen was always really inspiring to me and showed me that anyone can do it if you if you work at it. So that that was that was where I came from. I just came from that LA pop music world. Wow. So I know you've, you've, you're pretty young still. Um, so how long have you been doing this kind of working as a musician full time? Well, I was in a band uh, for a long time. I played in a band for about nine, 10 years. And then I started doing my own things for the last five years. So it's been about 15 years. I mean, I started when I was in my teens and, you know, I've just kept it going. So the band was awesome and I loved doing that. I learned a lot and I miss those times a lot. At the same time, I've never been as fulfilled as, as I am now being able to write my own music solely that's mine and, and go and tour and, and perform in that way. So it's been a long trek but now, you know, these, this next stage of the game has been, it's been really inspiring and, and hopefully it'll go on for a lot longer. Yeah. In a way, I understand where you're coming from. For me, working for corporate America, it doesn't matter. The paycheck was a great, you know, a great thing. And, uh, but, you know, it's like sometimes your parents or your close friends don't necessarily understand. I basically quit my job and start doing you know, working on my podcast and really what funnels or what funds the podcast is what I do on the freelancing and consulting side, helping performing artists, musicians, and just helping individuals really make their dreams possible. So I, I personally hope that I can get to do that for the rest of my life. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we live in the kind of world uh, nowadays that people are starting to really dive into themselves and try to work for themselves and find what, what's passionate in each of our souls and try and work on it. And that's inspiring for everybody else to see that. So the more we can do that and then yet come together and help each other, like hopefully it'll just keep growing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I really, I'm really enjoying this conversation that you reminded me of something because I read so much, uh, about you and, uh, kind of watch some of the other interviews or really kind of read the interviews and watch the music that you played on YouTube, I would say back even four or five years ago, just like you said, when you were kind of coming into your own, uh, is I notice a very generous act that you've been doing. Not sure if you noticed that. And I noticed in your messaging that you're always promoting not only yourself, but also a lot of other musicians out there. And uh, I've written down some names, you know, such as Katie, I think Katie Boeck. And yeah. You know, it was beautiful. Your voices coming together, just very harmonic. It was beautiful. But I noticed that you're constantly promoting, you know, things like Bandcamp and your collaboration with other singers, songwriters. And do you notice that you're you're proactively doing that? It's not just for yourself, but but others around you. Well, I guess I don't think of it specifically, but at the same time, I. I'm so inspired by the people around me. I mean, I guess I did it a little bit earlier with uh, Sunset's a Great Scott, talking about Story Pirates and Silver Lake Chorus. You know, it's funny. When I go and see a movie or go see a band with some friends of mine, I can be very judgmental. And there are times where they're like, dude, don't you like anything? <laughs> um, and I joke with them like, you know, you're right. I am, I am very critical and I don't want to kill your vibe. Like if you're not, if you're enjoying this and I'm not, I don't want to take that away from you at all. But when I love something, when I really enjoy, you know, a band or an artist of some sort, I just can't shut up about it either. So, you know, I have both sides of the spectrum. The things that I really, really enjoy, I've always had a profound uh, desire to share You'll see in coming months, I have some things that I'm working on outside of my music as a producer that have to do a little bit with that and fan life and supporting artists and sharing all of these worlds. I'm, you know, I am a songwriter and performer. And when I was younger, one of my biggest idols, not necessarily his music, but more of his 
lifestyle that I understood was Michael Stipe. I, he was the singer in a band. I loved that idea. And then as he grew older, he created a production company and started producing movies and making all sorts of different art content. And that was my dream. I wanted to start with music and make a name for myself with music and then start to spread out. And that is now beginning for me in its small way. And um, I'm hoping in one day I will have this production company fully thought out. But these, you know, Sunsets at Great Scots uh, is is a version of that. Um, this other project I'm working on that I'll announce in a, in a couple of months is a version of that. That said, I'm also still working on my music and trying to do videos and all of that. So I love promoting and I love trying to bring artists together and help other people create art and help people create home concerts and spread the word of of creation. Because that's, I don't know, for me, that's what life is. That's the magic of life, having these moments that we can really focus in on and celebrate art and sharing and community and what makes us really human. Mm, I love that statement. When it comes, it's hard to hold We want to chase the silver When it's too hard to carry gold We want to make mistakes We want hearts that won't break We want to feel the rhythm as it comes and goes It comes and goes Another, you know, if I were just connecting with you, uh, like... For the first, just hearing you, if some of my listeners listening to this, you know, not knowing exactly who you are yet and, and learning yeah. more, honestly, just I would have assumed that you're like the oldest child in the family. And I know that that's far from being true. And, you know, you have three siblings. And, and one thing I noticed with myself, even though I don't really have a uh, parents in, you know, entertainment, performing arts, but they were both incredibly accomplished. So uh, I feel like part of my childhood, especially, was in a way exciting and yet kind of stressful for me because uh, there was kind of overshadowing me. Like, and then the fact that you have your your parents, I mean, it sounds like your mom has a very significant impact in your creative life and your dad's an actor. I know uh, one of your brothers is an actor, the other is an editor. And then in the past few years, you're really coming into, you're coming into your own. What was that process like for you to kind of find your own identity and to declare something that honestly, no, I don't think anybody else in the family is doing professionally. Uh, yeah. Music was something that was always a hobby in my family. And my brother Ari, who's an editor, he was a big supporter of mine with music from the time I was a little kid. And he gave me his guitar, uh, which we call my guitar. So it's everyone's guitar. It's my guitar. Um, so <laughs> He was always big on helping me. He, I think, I think he always wanted to be a rock star in some way, and and you know play music. He loved playing guitar when he was young. So he's 15 years older than I am, and you know is a, is my brother, no question. But in some ways, you know, very father figurey uh, as well, along with my dad. But he was always really supportive of me and music. So. You're right. I come from an artsy family. My sister is incredibly talented. She started her career as a lawyer and transitioned into being a graphic designer and has always been a great artist in sorts and thinks in artistic ways and is really like, aside from just her practical talents of creating art, she also lives art. She she loves looking at it and creating it and, and helping facilitate it. And we all do. And that definitely comes from my mother. Um, my father is an actor and Although he is an artist as well, my mom really was a craftswoman. She always had us working on projects and made sure that we all learned how to play an instrument and took us to the museum and made sure we watched programs on television that were different kinds of art. She's just a huge art person. And I'll be honest, the home concerts came out of her idea. She's like, why don't you just have a concert here in our house and invite That's your friends awesome. over and start it that way? Uh, why don't you go to other people's homes? And then when I actually did it, she's like, no, don't go to other people's homes. That's not safe. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> You're crazy. And I said, well, it's too late. It's your fault. Um, so, so she created an environment for our family that was just full of art. And it's funny because she created an environment full of art. All she wanted us to be were lawyers. But her world was all of art yet she still wanted us to be lawyers. She wanted us to make the money that lawyers make 
but she wanted us to live a world of art. And her compromise, I said, is, well, that's that's my brother, Gabriel. You got you got a pretend lawyer on TV. I think that's the best, <laughs> that's the best you can do. And your, your daughter was a lawyer and she quit and turned into a graphic artist. So you almost got it. <laughs> this is so cute. I, uh, I even didn't write down this. I noticed that um, you come from a, a Jewish family and I am intimately familiar with it. My significant other is uh, Jewish and yeah, yeah. And then I love. I couldn't stop talking about the food. I love it, you know. And uh, watching uh, Gabriel in this case, uh, kind of. Yeah. There's always a bagel on suits. Which, <laughs> and I'm when I binge watch late at night, I'm thinking, oh no, it's New York bagels again. It's killing me. And very funny. Yeah. Well, you know. Jewish people have had their hands in the arts for for years and years and songwriters and musicians. And I mean, all cultures have everything right. But art was always a really important part. And when I was younger and I started music, I kind of asked my mom, I said once, like, why do you think I got into music? Like, I know you made me do lessons, but I always hated my lessons. What, What do you think? Like, why do you think it means so much to me? And when I was a kid, I actually went to, I'm not, I'm not religious, I'm, I'm spiritual, uh, but I'm not particularly religious, but I'm very proud to be Jewish. And, and I went to a Jewish private school my whole childhood. I went from nursery school to eighth grade. And one of the things about going to that kind of school was that we had to go to services and none of us turned out to be very religious, but we still had to go to <laughs> services three times a week. So there was a lot of singing that was going on three times a week. And we'd spend that time just singing and joking around. And I had a lot of time to mess around with my voice and make fun of the prayers and joke with my friends and then sing harmonies. I mean, you had to keep yourself busy in these services some way or the other. And I then she's like, you went to services three times a week for 14 years. I mean, it's ingrained in you singing and coming together for music. I mean, art is a huge part of who you are just because of that school. So I think that's where that came from. And when she said it, I was like, you know, I think that's right. It really is where my my joy for it came from. It's almost muscle memory. It's just something I'm very familiar with. And growing up as a, as a Jewish kid, there was a lot of art in our school. There was arts and crafts and theater productions and talking about the holidays and creating art uh, for those holidays and celebrating and skits and dancing and music. And I just love all that stuff. And it was, it's a huge part of the Jewish community. This this is an incredible origin story. And I personally have been to so many bar mitzvahs. And I can imagine that you probably nailed the sing, singing part at that point, <laughs> at that uh, age. I don't know about nailed it, but I definitely tried hard. <laughs> My intentions were strong. Uh, you know, I... I I'm not a big person to to show off about my voice. I don't think I particularly have a great voice. I think I have a voice that that does okay. You know, I obviously love singers who are really, really great and talented, but the singers who I really love are the singers who write great songs and their voices help communicate the voice of the song. And that's why Bob Dylan can be so great or Elvis Costello or a guy who I love, John Bryan. They're not necessarily voices that you would listen to and really think are great singers, but they are great singers because they have great stories to tell. And that's the journey I'm on, trying to write a great song, always trying to write a great song and something that's appropriate for my voice, something that my voice can translate. What I'm trying to find is how can my voice communicate a great story? And I think when I find a really true story or true nugget of existential crisis or story or or journey or something that I'm really thinking about that we can all relate to, when I'm able to wrangle that theme into words and melody and lyric, when I can get all that together, that's when my voice sounds great because it's not my voice that they're, I think, really responding to. I think what they're hopefully responding to is the emotion behind it. And the story, I think you're a fantastic storyteller and I'm so happy about what we're doing right now because to be honest, I read so much about you, but this level of details and the way kind of hearing in your, in your own voice to share these stories and in nuggets, and it's very, very powerful. I think I personally, as a listener, I understand your songs a lot more because of this conversation. And, you know, thank you for that. Yeah. No, I I appreciate you saying that. And I don't say this to pat myself on the back by any means, but I think one reason why the, the home concerts go well and what I'm still trying to figure out and how to do with my with my records is sort of what you say. I think that people, what they really love about the home concerts, I'm, I, I don't merely just get up and perform the songs. I tell stories. 
I tell them where this, why I wrote what I wrote before I tell the song. It's sort of that Nashvilleian tradition where I go into what it's all about, and I think it helps the songs. I think it, I think it helps people follow along, and they absolutely have their own interpretations of the songs, and I love that. But I think there's something to knowing where an author was coming from, and being in on the joke, you know, being in on the story, so that when I'm going through it, they can follow along in that way, and. That's something that I'm still trying to figure out how to do via Twitter and Instagram. And, uh, you know, I can do it live. I can do it in my concerts, but it's really hard to figure out how to do that with my records and with social media. And one way I'm trying to do that is with my Patreon, which is like a subscriber site. And I'll put up exclusive content there and write little little blog pieces that go along um, and to help tell the stories and explain where things are coming from and what I really love. Like I put one up today about a new song I wrote called West Side. And I tell the story about the guitar solo and how we came up with that guitar solo and why I really love it and what the sound means to me and where that comes from. And now hopefully people will listen to the, watch the video and say, oh, now I can really appreciate that guitar solo because I know where he was coming from. And I find that I love that when I watch other other artists, you know, that's why behind the music, that television show did so well. And the television show unplugged did so well. People loved hearing the stories behind the music. And I think that tradition continues. Mm. As you're talking about, I think that our conversation definitely deepened quite a bit. And, uh, I notice, and I typically steer away from just a general about and bio. And I couldn't help noticing, uh, one of the things that you did mention in your bio is I believe in 2012 that, uh, something really scary and traumatic happened to you after a concert and you ended up needing, a a heart surgery. So I was really, uh, shocked by that, you know, and thinking mm. about how that potentially changed the way you communicate your songs and your stories. Yep. Well, Suitcase Heart, that record was influenced by that. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go on a tangent of woe is me because everybody has a story in their way. And my procedure that I had has a very high success rate. So it ended up working out really nicely. And I was very lucky. But I just had I had a uh, I had something called an SVT and my heart would beat up to 260 beats per minute, which is about 100 beats per minute faster than the normal heart when you're exercising. And it's about four times faster than when your heart is like at normal rest. And it wouldn't, it would just come out of nowhere. It was sort of like a so that uh I had it for 10 years and I just thought it was normal. And then I almost passed out after a show and I ended up going to a a doctor and the doctor was like, oh yeah, you have this thing called an SVT. We need to do a procedure tomorrow. <laughs> so like, all right. So that was a that was a wake up call. That was my first real uh, personal, physical, you know, wake up call. By no means did I ever think I was immortal. But, you know, we all have this sense of our own physical selves. And when that's broken and you have a new appreciation for your life in a way, uh, that obviously changes our perspective. So that song, Suitcase Heart, it was the mix. It was suitcase. It's this traveling of our stories and telling our stories. And I had that relationship ended about three weeks after the procedure. So I had a figurative broken heart and I had a literal broken heart and both were being healed at the same time. And that's what went into that record. So Suitcase Heart engulfs all of that. I think I can see just uh, through YouTube messages and how that new, your, in this case, your sophomore album, Suitcase Heart, resonated with a lot of your listeners and knowing that maybe some of them know sort of this is the story behind all of that. It made me think, just a kind of not so funny story, but because Seth Godin, uh, he couldn't shut up about this guy named Ben Zander, who is a conductor in Boston. And yeah. he's world famous. So I I personally, you're going to laugh, I don't really like classical music, but I went anyway, just experienced. And I ended up like just 
pouring with tears and like I was so emotional and uh, it was yeah. even phenomenal and and then he mentioned uh, as a teacher one of his students uh, came up to him he works he used to work at Boston Conservatory and one of his students literally just went through a nasty divorce and was completely heartbroken and came up to him and asked him for advice on how he could possibly go on with music and his life and and Ben said that he was secretly happy for him because he said especially for an artist or a musician that once you go through such emotional trauma sometimes that's when you produce some of your best work that may even be impossible to replicate so yes there's no question you know when something happens to you you can write about it and i agree with you fully i the one caveat i have to that is that it's funny because one of the arguments I was having with my ex-girlfriend when I was working on the record, she said, you know, at least you're going to have a lot of material to write about. And I got so angry because I, I thought I thought that was a really self-involved thing to say. But what I also thought is that life is going to hit you no matter what. Good things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. So whether it's a breakup or a heart procedure or a baby is born or uh, you get a promotion, if you are an artist mind, if you have the mindset to be creative, if you are a, a communicative person, you will ingest what happens in your world and bring it through your filter and then expel it out again back into the world for all of us to share and hopefully learn from and communicate and so on and so forth. So I don't really want to believe that you need bad things to happen to you to create. By no means do I think that bad things that do happen to you, that it can be a godsend and you can have a really intense, you know, expel of, of that. That's amazing too. But I don't want to lean on that. I don't, you know, I, I felt like I don't want just to aim for bad things to happen in my world so I can write a good record. Mm -hmm. And I love how you describe, and I know I've taken up an hour of your time at this point, but I want to ask one last question, if that's okay with you, yeah. which is I, the way you talk about creative work and process. And, you know, I find that given that now I don't have a full-time job to go to, that coming back to my work, always showing up for my work sounds a lot easier in theory than in real practice. So there are definitely some challenges. And because, and this is to quote somebody else, because Brian Koppelman, who said, you know, creating is failure all the time, you know, external and, you know, internal. So external validations, like the money, the likes, the comments, and, but also like internally, I wonder, you know, how do you make, make sure, or how do you balance that? You know, if your work represents the idea you're trying to put forward more fully, more accurately? How do you, how do you manage your own expectation and, and keep showing up for your work? Oh, well, it's a brutal. And his <laughs> quote is a great quote. I haven't heard that, but it's true. The blank page and, and failure is really scary. Luckily, the high of the completion of a piece of art, I think, is what keeps us coming back. It's those highs of when we are able to line up with our own moral integrity and the universe and uh, our community around us. And for me, melody and vibration, you know, the actual physical sensation of playing an instrument and singing. When all that lines up and the universe stops and you know that you're in the zone, right? Whether you're an athlete or an artist or whatever it is, that zone moment, there's no high that matches that. And I think that's what I come back for. And that's going to be there no matter what, forever. You know, as many good songs as you write, you're always going to write, want to write another one. As many bad songs as you write, you're going to want to continue to try and find a good one. That's what I keep coming back for. Um, and luckily, that's a drive that I just have in myself. You know, I teach guitar too. And some parents are like, you know, my kid just doesn't have that drive to practice. And some people don't have that drive to practice and they need a mom or, or somebody else to tell them what to do. But I do also have students where I see it and they have that drive in them, whether they're eight or they're 17. I think we all have that drive for something in our lives. And it's just a matter of finding what that something is. Some of it's guitar, some of it's songwriting. I, for me, that something is creating art and being part of a community that wants to ingest art and help each other create. And I'm constantly trying to find that because when I find that, those highs, whether it's Katie, who I sing with, 
or it's a host that brings me all the way out to Germany to share art, or it's my mom who wants to put photographs in her books and that connection, whatever it is, I think that lining up of the universe, that intention is what makes life really fulfilling for me. And I try to hold on to that. So when I'm having a long day and I, the last thing I want to do is pick up my guitar and, and try to write another song. I think of those moments and I know that if I just pick up the guitar and start strumming and I'm impatient about five to 10 minutes later, I'll start, I'll start feeling that zone and I'll reach out to it. And it's not always going to work. But you, the only thing you can do is try. And as long as you try, then it'll happen. If you don't try, it won't happen. Wow. I'm going to like listen to this part like a two and a half minute. And, but when I get stuck doing my creative work, I really mean it because you brought me back to standing in front of a computer sometimes two or three in the morning, you know, back then uh, producing an episode. But like before I interviewed you, any of my guests, no one were no, under the radar. I just get this high. It's almost like I'm on drugs, you know? It's, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's indescribable. Well- it is. It is. And and it's about trying. I think we're all trying to communicate that, like, go find your high in what we do. Um, if you are truly, high, I believe that if, if we are truly passionate and find the passion, in the things that we do, it's infectious and it will start it in somebody else. You just got it's just transference of energy. I know that sounds woo woo, but like, that's what it is. You get inspired, create something with it, pass it on and then look for the next wave that's coming your way. It's all a circle. I, I, man, we, we could be evil twins. And what you just said is precisely what happened to me after going to see Cirque du Soleil. And I reach out to, uh, at this point, three, four artists. And, uh, and it's just amazing inviting them onto the podcast, talk about, you know, when they get scared, when they do fail, instead of just the show that we've been all witnessing. And since then we've, been literally best friends. I follow these people everywhere from Vegas to New York and to cheer them on. And absolutely. (laughs) That's cool. Well, we can be, but we're definitely spiritual twins in that way. And I think there's a lot of us. We're not just twins. We're hundreds and hundreds. I think we all feel that same. I think that most people feel that. And it's just about finding that little, that little gem in all of us. You know, I think, I think we all have that world and maybe it's art, maybe it's maybe it's athletics, whatever it is. But what's important is for all of us to see that little piece of energy, that little piece of positive energy and pass it around because there's the positive and there's clearly a negative one, too, that's easy to get on to and pass that around. And the more we can continue to talk about it and be open with it and be and talk about our fears, like it sounds like you're doing with other people as well, and talk about our positive energy, like if we can continue that conversation and not hold it in and not resent it. And the more we can communicate it, I'm guilty of holding on to it too. I'm guilty of not expressing it too. The more we can let it out, I think the more positivity we create in our world and that might come out as art, but it comes out inevitably and we just keep passing it on. Wow. I love this. I wrote down positivity, which, you know, something that I feel like really represents you very well. And I, I had no idea that this conversation could be uh, just this amazing. I really, I'm That's really so, thankful. Well, I, and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that you gave me the opportunity to talk. Thank you so much for, for including me in your, in your audience and your world. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks, Jesse, and take care. Bye. 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 Hey, it's Faye. I am back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at faceworld.com or social channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, also under FaceWorld to keep things simple. I personally review and respond to all the messages. Love to hear from you. Thank you and lots of hugs. See you next week. Don't be afraid to go la, da, 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 da. Don't be afraid to go la, da, 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 da. We want to keep on moving Keep on dancing, moving our feet We want to pay
tide as it comes and goes, it comes and goes. Time slowly puts holes in the sweater, loosens the threads, and they hold us together. 